Welcome. This is Karen Modakaitis, and you're listening to How She Really Does It, the place where inspiration and possibility meet on KDRT 95.7 FM. Do you have a loved one who is close to death? Are you afraid of death and dying? Do you want to know more about what happens as we die? I realize these are not uplifting questions. Or maybe you're like me and just try to think, I'm too young for this. I'm not going to think about this right now, right? Um, But all of these questions, they may trigger a great deal of fear and you may not want to, you may want to turn the show off right now. And I invite you to stay with us and be open to my conversation with Martha Atkins. She has a PhD and she shares her story and her research about death and dying. Martha is the founder and chief executive officer of Atkins Ossity LLC, where she works with individuals who are dying and the families who love them. Her work in the world is to help people be less afraid of death and dying. Wow, that's really beautiful. Martha, hello and welcome to my show. Thank you so much. So, you know, I was laughing. I was watching your TEDx talk and I will have a link on the interview page. And when you talked about how you were at a party or and people asked you what you did and then they said, oh, I need to go get a drink. <laughs> And they never came back. And that reminded me of um, Brene Brown when, you know, when she was first starting out and people would say to her, so what do you do? Well, I'm a vulnerability and shame researcher. Oh, well, that's nice. (laughs) Got to (laughs) go. Right. right. So where's the cheese? (laughs) But look look how she's changed the world with vulnerability and shame. And, you know, I'm hoping that with you and this work that you're doing, can really, again, whether it's people like me who are like, oh, I'm just not going to think about that because it's not the most pressing, to others who have fear, but we're all still kind of hiding away from it, where we can actually have a conversation and not have fear around death and dying anymore. I'm hoping that too. There really hasn't been a conversation in this country since Kubler-Ross was around uh, end of 1960s, early 70s, and she wrote her seminal book on death and dying, and um, the conversation started... And um, she carried it for a long time, and, and there really hasn't been one. And I, I will say the conversation is it is changing a lot. There there are uh, voices here and there, um, women who started the death cafes across the world, and the New York Times has written a bunch of pieces on dying, and um, it, it is more to the um, forefront, but there hasn't been hasn't been a voice. And I, I would love to be the voice. I think that would be a blast. So I started, I started talking and, um, and yay, I get to talk to you today. <laughs> yay. Well, and as you started <laughs> talking, I mean, there, you're making shifts. There's, there's been a lot of influence to people that, as you talk about this, uh, the subject and the one thing, like for me, who's a recovering, you know, certainty addict, right? Um, mm-hmm. the one thing that we are guaranteed is that we will go through this process of death and dying, whether it's ourselves personally or other people, we are guaranteed that. It is true. So let's talk. Um, so I okay. want to, will you share your story, your own story around death and dying? Sure. So, um, my, my dad is a Methodist minister and he's retired, long retired, but that doesn't ever go away. He's always that. But when I was, when I was a wee one, um, we went to church often. And when I was five, I was staying out on a, a ranch and the the woman who was taking care of me sent me out to see a a mama kit, a mama cat and some kittens. And one of the kittens had died and I needed to have a funeral for that kitten. And the woman got me a box and got me a spade. And off I went down the farm road across a cattle guard over to the other side where there was some nice red Oklahoma dirt. And I dug a, uh, a hole for the, um, for the box and for the kitten and put the kitten in and put a little cross on top and had my own little prayer service for it. And I was talking to a therapist some years later after my brother died, and she said, how did you know how to do that? And I have often thought of that question, and I don't know, other than to say I think that that sometimes we come into the world with um, particular gifts or particular knowings, or we don't have fears about particular things. And for some reason, death and dying is, is the thing that I'm not scared of and I like to talk about, and, uh, and I think uh, that's 
that's a um, that's the place where it started for me. My brother Jim died when I was 23. I worked at a children's hospital at that time, and we had a a kid who had come in from South Texas who had choked on a hot dog. He was 12 years old, and um, his mother hadn't been told that he was going to die, just that they were going to bring him to the hospital and fix him, and he was brain dead by the time he got to us. And I um, remember going in and telling the nurses that I wanted to be there to to uh, be with the family when the kid was taken off of the respirator. And I went in, and the, he had been taken off, and there was a student nurse that was standing at the monitor watching. The family wasn't around. I was very perplexed. Um, so I st- stood with the kid, and I held his hand and talked to him, and he died. And pretty soon before that, I had done a handprint for him, and I had given it to the social worker to give to the mom. Um, the family didn't speak English. I was really upset that nobody was with him, and I found out later that this was a very patriarchal family, and the the father had decided it was going to be easiest for everyone if um, the boy was alone. And uh, that evening, I hit the elevators to go home. It was really late, and that mother was standing there holding that handprint, and um, she looked at me, and I didn't speak I, I didn't speak Spanish. She didn't speak English, but she looked at me and she said, "Gracias." And I said, Donata, that was my, my one Spanish word. And I, I cried and she cried. And then I went down the stairs and she went down the elevator. And that was that. Um, that was 30 days after my brother had died. I'd been taken off out of the intensive care unit because the, my boss um, thought that I needed to be away for 30 days. And I don't know why 30 days was some magical time. But there had been no deaths in the ICU that, that whole time. And the day that I got back, this kid was there. Um, I knew pretty soon after that that I was going to need to leave um, the hospital. I was going to need to do something else because I was so tired and I was so wrapped up in my own grief. Um, Jim had died of a long QT syndrome, the basketball, the guys that, that die on the basketball court or they seem perfectly healthy. He had a, it's called long QT syndrome and he just died one night and our family was uh, bereft, bereft and devastated and, uh, I suddenly went from living death and dying professionally in my work at this hospital to living it personally, and it was a whole other whole other ball game. So I left. Uh, I went and finished my master's degree, and one of the, in fact, it was the last class I took. The the professor Larry Golden asked me to write about starting a children's service in San Antonio that didn't exist. So I wrote about starting a children's grief center. And he, he took off a quarter of a point for punctuation. He was so proud of that <laughs> and gave me an A on the paper and said, you really should do this. And I was um, 26. And at 27, I decided I'd go ahead and do that. And I, I didn't know I didn't know any better, so I did it. Um, and I, I pulled some people together, some really fabulous, wonderful people. And we were able to start at a children's grief center in San Antonio. And I ran that until 2005. So I was around... Uh, grieving people in a different way. We were able to to buy this gorgeous, beautiful three-story house with hardwood floors and high ceilings and teddy bears, and um, kids and families would come in, and they could talk about their grief and play and uh, get better, be with other people who understood where they were, and it was a, it was a really marvelous time and uh, gorgeous. Absolutely loved it. My mother... Towards the end of that time, my mother was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, and I, I left the bereavement center. I decided I would go ahead and go back and start my PhD, and then mom was diagnosed all within about three weeks. Um, I was able to be with my mom, and uh, about that last she lasted about six months after that. And one of the things that happened uh, as part of her process was these deathbed visions, and. Um, I remember talking to the kids about it and the kids would have, they would talk about things that happened before the person died and then they would talk about after death communication. So one kid would come in and she she said, um, I felt my bed go down the other night. And I said, well, what do you think it was? And she said, well, it was my dad. He came and sat on my bed. Like it was the stupidest question in the world. So I got to hear those things. I got to um, engage in those conversations all the time. So when mother was sick, I said, mom, there may be a point where um, people come to you to help you go. And I laugh now. I, I 
I teach people about death and dying, and I couldn't even say I couldn't say die to my own mother. When you, when it's time for you to go, there may be these people that show up. Um, it could be relatives, it could be angels. I don't know what it is, but if somebody shows up, will you tell me? And she she's walking down the hall, and she kind of looked over her shoulder, and she said, "It depends on who it is." <laughs> Quacked me up. I don't know who she thought was going to show up, and I can't wait. someday I'm going to ask her. But she. Um, probably about a week before she died, she was in, we had her in a hospital bed. She was in the living room of our home. We uh, didn't want her back away. She needed to be in the middle of, of all the, of the family. And she was, and I was sitting with her one afternoon and her eyes were closed and I was watching her watch something under her closed eyelids. And I said, mom, what do you see? And she said, granddaddy and grandmother, uncle Claude and aunt Lala and mother and daddy. So these are, these are her people. And I kind of leaned in and I said, Mom, where are they? And she said, walking up the road from the farmhouse. And I've got, I've got a picture on my wall of an old white farmhouse that's in West Texas where Mom used to go when she was a child. And it's that farmhouse. It was her, it was her great-grandparents' place. My brother Jim had died, and I wondered where he was. Uh, I had had a dream that Jim was sitting in a chair reading a book, hanging out, waiting for Mom. And I called my brother, John, and I said, I had this weirdest dream. And he said, I had one that was really similar to that. And so then I said, Mom, where's Jim? And she said, oh, he's been right here. So we've got this really great picture of Jim come sitting there hanging out waiting for her. And then the night Mom died, she was doing this reaching thing where she was reaching up towards something, um, grimacing. And I didn't know then that that was part of this whole deathbed vision, deathbed phenomenon thing. But I have, have since learned that. So um, those pieces have all worked together to get me here. Uh, I did my dissertation research, research on deathbed phenomena and how uh, counseling professionals are changed as a result, and then how we know that we know that when when someone's worldview is changed, the way they would do their work in the world is changed. So for for counselors who go and do this work with people, um, when they uh, are with somebody, our witness to somebody having these things, there's a change that occurs and there's a change in the way that they do their work. So that was what my, my research was around. And now I just get to hear all these fabulous stories from people. When I, when I, you know, talking about Brene sit on the plane, it is people either say, <laughs> yeah, this is, let me tell you a story. And I get to hear these fabulous stories about angels or people who's, who've come or, who knows what, or, you know, their head goes down in their book, which is, it's absolutely true. It's like, oh, that's nice. Your books go in. They don't want to hear anything else about it. <laughs> do they think you're the crazy one? Sometimes they do. <laughs> Sometimes they do. And I am just fine with that because I know better. I know better. So it sounds like you can be okay with them thinking that, judging you and thinking you're the crazy one because you're rooted in the world that you, you work in and do this work. Yeah, I, yeah, I really am. I I gave up being worried about what people think a long time ago, and that is primarily because I've heard so many stories, and I've been with so many people who have had healing experiences through this, and and their grief process is different because they had information uh, on the outset. So, um, it uh, here, so I'll just I'll, let me just talk a little bit about my dad. My dad has been, I'm sick the last, he's been sick a long time. He's been in and out, in and out of the hospital. Um, and he started doing uh, the deathbed vision, deathbed phenomenon things. And there's a, there's a trajectory and I followed the frequency of the trajectory over this last week. And there, there are different kinds of reaching that happen. There are different kinds of conversations that the sick person will have. And he had all those. And it, it was really it's fascinating to watch. And I know as I teach people about those, because I've gotten I've gotten emails and letters from people that when they know what those what the process is, when they get to the end of it and their person's gone, there's some comfort there because the they're able to make meaning of what happened beforehand. And and we know uh, the grief research now is about meaning making. You you get better when you can when you can make meaning from the situation. Um, can you say more about that? Who gets better? So yeah, so 
the the way that we gre- the the Freud was the one who started talking about grief work, and he said that we needed to completely cut off from the person who died, and we needed to have nothing else to do with them. And then when his daughter died, he changed his tune a little bit, and then some other people came along subsequently that kind of were a mixed mash of what he said, and then um, and then uh, stages. Or there are certain things that you have to go certain certain stages. Or I'm sorry, I'm trouble finding my word today. Uh, situations that you go through, and that's what's going to make you get better. And now we know that it's there's a story that gets told, and when you tell and retell the story, um, you can tell it in a way that's healing. Um, and it's there's a therapy called narrative therapy. That is that is about that. So what is the story you tell yourself about the person who died? What is the story you tell yourself about your own grief? Uh, and, and I guess the way I'm looking at my work, it's that I'm helping people tell a different story very early on because I'm giving them information and they can watch and see what happens. And, uh, and in that learning, they don't have to be so scared. So here's an example. I used to tell... I used to my, uh, prepare kids to go to funerals, mm-hmm. and I would tell them to go into the the room where the casket is at the funeral home and look at the ceiling and see what kind of lights there were. Because there's usually there not usually there always there's a purple light and a pink light, and those shine down on the person who's in the casket, and it um, there's makeup on the person and it makes the person look better. So for kids to give them something to look at in the room instead of the person is empowering and it kind of, it, it, um, it gives them something to do in a different way. Mm-hmm. So I'll tell them to look for the Kleenex box or I'll tell them to look for maybe the drawer in the casket. Some of the caskets have drawers that you can leave messages, uh, stuff like that. So when I'm working with, with folks who have a family member who's dying, I'll say, here's some things you, here's some things you can look for. They may begin to do some reaching or they may begin to talk about, uh, work they did earlier in their lifetime. A, a, a family um, that I was visiting with just a couple of months ago, he was a police officer. And so in in his dying process, there were some conversations that he had, words he was saying, not to anyone in particular, but the conversations he was having about that work, he about uh, being in the police academy. My dad was... Um, he was working at weddings last week. He was, uh, there was a bride and a groom in the back of the room and he was telling them where to walk. He did some prayers. He had a, a Sunday school lecture thing that he did. He was a Methodist preacher. So it, um, these were part of his work. And as I was watching these things unfold, it was just fascinating to me because it, it is, it's, this is, this is how it unfolds. So I, I talk to people about this and tell them what they can see, what they might see. And then they take that and figure out what kind of meaning to make of it. Uh, And then in that meaning-making process, uh, that folds into their, how they're going to grieve. So Martha, do you mean the person who is um, not the person that's dying, but the person that is there with their loved one? Exactly. They're the ones that are making, yes, they're the ones that are making the meaning. Okay. And so this is to how to help with, with the grief of this person who's dying. Exactly. And it's not, you know, it's, it's not like we sit around and let's talk about how we're going to make meaning of this right now. It's not that. Um, this is kind of a high level, you know, you're sitting around looking, holding your loved one's hand. How are we going to make meaning of this? That's not that at all. Um, uh, I it, Practically, it is sitting there and watching them and they're looking around the room at things or they look over to the side of the room and say, look, there's an angel over there. And instead of going, oh my gosh, they're hallucinating. Um, I teach people that this is part of near-death awareness. This is part of the deathbed phenomenon. Um, They may see things like this. And then when it happens, you go, oh yeah, this is that thing she told me about. This is, this is one of those things that happens when somebody's nearing death. And then when it happens, it's not, oh my God, they're hallucinating. We need to get them drugs. It's okay. This is part of the process. I knew this was going to happen. Let's see what's next. And it takes that uh, easting gross out of it. 
So for those of us, most of us really love certainty, right? What sounds like what you do is you kind of help them prepare that there's this process that goes through. So instead of them going to that place of, oh, this is crazy, they're hallucinating and, you know, added that on this potential that of the future loss. Exactly. Right? Which then exactly. drains the person with the story. It just, it it's like, and it shouldn't be this way. They go, this is the process that Martha was talking about. And there can exactly. be less judgment, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, and, and I think back on on my career, and this is really what I've done. This is really what I've done. I started as a child life specialist at a children's hospital where we would prepare kids for surgery if they were going to have a pin put in their leg and we'd get a doll and we'd show what leg it was going to be on and we'd make a cast for the doll. And when they woke up, they would have a cast on the same leg and they would have their doll. And then at the bereavement center, talking about grief and what it feels like and um, what anger feels like, we'd shake up 7-Up cans and put Mentos in it and talk about volcanoes and what happens when you don't let your anger out. And now um, talking to people about the dying, the dying process and that there is a there is there are things that happen that are common across the whole world. It doesn't matter what age you are, what color you are, or where you live. These things happen, and um, giving people a sense of that so so they don't have to be so scared. That's what it is. And does that help them be more like I always like to use the word compassion observer, like be present in the moment instead of when mm. if they're judging, they're in this place of fear. And what do we do in fear? We either try we try to fight it or flee from it, right? Or sometimes freeze in it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I love that compassion observer. I think that's a that's a great term for this. Yeah. And and uh, knowledge knowledge can be power. It really can. And it can can give you know, if 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 the person in the family whom everybody looks up to is freaking out when somebody's dying, everybody else is gonna be freaking out. If if the Somebody in the room who is that leader for the family can say, yeah, this this is happening. Um, yeah, they're doing that reaching thing. Yeah, now their breathing has changed a little bit. Um, there's nothing to be scared of. This is all part of the process. They're not hurting. This uh, it it just changes the it changes the whole dynamic. And you, you've been in a room with people who are completely freaked out and fearful, and I have too. And it's uh, it it hurts. It just there's a there's a different kind of resonance, and I I really want for people to be able to be in that calm, peaceful resonance as that person is leaving, and and help walk them out in that kind of energy because uh, it's just it's just way more peaceful, and and when you hearken back to that later, uh, there's peacefulness. So I just had this kind of aha moment. As you were speaking, and you know, one of my questions as you were telling us your story about death, right? And and it seems to me, you can tell me where I'm wrong, that you've had quite a bit of uh, experience with death in your life, right? With family members, I have professionally. Yeah. It's it's been kind of a constant theme um, right. in your life. Like swimming's been a constant theme in my life. <laughs> Um, right, right. But, but so, I, and I was thinking about that. I was like, oh my gosh, how do you not get drained from being around death so much? Because so often when we experience death, my dad died about, I don't know, 14 or 15 years ago. And it, it mm -hmm. is so draining. But it sounds like because you're not in this place of fear, you, you it doesn't drain you as energetically as much as others. Am I off base on that? I, I think that's probably, yeah, I think that's probably right. I don't, it's not, it's not an angsty process for me. Mm -hmm. And, and by that, I mean, um, I certainly get teary and I certainly can be in, in moments where a family comes together and something happens that, um, it's just so profound and beautiful. And I'm, I'm right there in the moment with that. But, but as far as death being frightening to me or the process being frightening to me, it's just not anymore. And and I think you're right. It's because I've been around it so much and I get that most people haven't. And, and that's part of my, um, that's part of my, that's part of my job. I get that's part of my job is to explain 
what I've seen and how I've seen it and bring other people into the conversation um, to get them to share their story so that we can take all of there's just so much it, it's that angst word there's just so much angst around this and and we're all going to die um, people have been dying before us for thousands of years and um, and it hurts and it's painful and the ones we love go and we wish that they could be back um, but if we can can look at it uh, as the process, as the just we we bring people into the world and we walk people out, and and give give people knowledge about it and and things to do too. I think that's the other thing. We sit around and wring our our hands because we think we're supposed to be doing something. And so I I teach people about meditations. I teach people about. Um, uh, doing things in the room, like setting up candles and um, uh, sitting around the bed and pl- even playing cards. If the person likes to play cards, we sit around and play cards. And it doesn't have to be this uh, really terrible, morose thing. And I love hearing stories from people who have been sitting vigil in hospice and, and the waxing and waning that happens of emotions. Because you do go from, oh my God, this person's really leaving to being so tickled that you're you're crying and laughing so hard about something. I, I was with my friend um, Lydia. Her sister was dying, and somebody told some joke about the about the sister about Chris who was who was in the bed dying. We got so tickled that the nurses came in to make sure we were okay because they couldn't tell if we were laughing or crying, and we were laughing so hard. But it, it that that was as important as the the tears that we had later, and and honoring all of those emotions and letting people know that all of that is okay is so important. I think it's so important. Well, absolutely. And, and, you know, when we talk about this idea of fear and, um, you know, and that the draining and the fact that you can help prepare people because you've had a lot of practice, right. At death and dying and, and grieving. Right, right. And most people haven't. And if you're like me who, you know, really kind of stayed, I've just been decided to flee from it. I haven't had to, I've had, you know, very little experience with it. And then I can just say, Oh, I don't have to deal with this right now, but it's going to come. I mean, I know that it's guaranteed. So to, for you to be able to help people provide practice and calmness is like what I do when I go to the pool and I have parents who are very concerned and panicked about what's going to happen to their child. Will they, you know, drown? Right. And I'm like, we got this. This is okay. I know yeah. I can teach your kid how to swim. I can't tell you how long it's going to take, but I know I can teach them yep. how to swim. Right. And it's like, you can yep. teach people exactly. like how to go through this process because you've had a lot of practice and it's that, um, that roomy what's that roomy saying of um oh i'm gonna mangle it like you know if you are panicked <laughs> if you are panicked stand with me because i am not it's kind of that theme and uh right right I'm, right I, i'm no martha beck that can just recite you're, quotes you're troubled stand come with me for i am not there you it's go something like yeah. that i think i just mangled it too something like that yeah. there we go we can mangle it together but mm-hmm. so you provide that for people in that space um you know what i'm what i'm realizing it's it's all about um, as I've been with my dad this last week, it's about tracking the frequency and tr- tracking the frequency of where they are and honoring that. And and even as much death as I've been around and in my own family and the people I've been with, and, and this is, I've been doing this for 20 years, uh, I fully expected my father to not be here this weekend. Uh, it, it has, uh, this path with him this last week has been, been astounding. What I realized today is he's in, a hospital and this is of course this seems like a, a no-brainer but he he's in a hospital and the hospital's job is to make him well um, had he been on a hospice this last week he probably would be gone this weekend but he's not and we've had lots of conversations in our family about what's the line um, do we keep giving him antibiotics or do we not and uh, and I'm saying this because it really doesn't matter that I have all this experience. Um, what it boils down to this is my dad and my family, and uh, I can I can have all the information in the world. And w- what I really needed to do, and what I've ended up doing, is tracking the frequency of where he is and what he needs. And um, he got antibiotics, and he is uh, on an upswing. 
and was able to get up and walk a little bit yesterday and I uh, talked to him a little bit this morning and he's a little bit different this morning and, and I don't know where he's going to go, but uh, rather than trying to predict it or trying to control it, it's tracking that frequency. So it, this experience for me in the last two weeks is going to change to the way how, the way I teach people and it's going to be about that. And these are the, these are the things you watch for and um, everybody in your family may be reacting differently and how do you get yourself grounded and centered and where are your boundaries and then where everybody else's boundaries and, um, and seeing how it flows. It's a, it's a, no two families are alike. No two deaths are alike. Um, it's something, it's just, there's so much mystery and wonder in it. And that's the, that's the part I love so much. So when you talk about tracking frequencies, what do you mean? Can you give us some specific examples? So, so my dad had, and this is really common. You'll see people, they, they talk, uh, somebody was saying this week, he was talking out of his head. That's a good Texas thing. He's talking out of his head and it is, he's just kind of crazy talk, but every once in a while in the middle of the crazy talk, there'll be a phrase that's thrown out. And one that, one that he did a day before yesterday, I, he said, I asked him where he was and he said, I know where I am, but he would never tell me. And I said, well, tell me where you are. And he said, I'm in my temporary home and I want to go to my permanent home. Now, some people will hear that and go, yeah, his temporary home's at the hospital and he wants to go to his permanent home back at his uh, assisted living. And that very well may be. But that comment, uh, coupled with all of the other comments from the, earlier in the week, which were he looked up at one point and said, there's an angel up in the corner room. Do, do you see it? There's five or six of us in the room. And he kind of whooshed his arm up to the left side of the room. And there's this angel and we didn't see it, but we told him we were glad it was there. And we all waved. So there's an angel. That's a, that's a frequency tracking. Um, he asked me to, Oh, he asked if I would just go on and push open the door. So he's kind of crazy talk, crazy talk. He opens his eyes. He looks at me, clears, clear as he can be. And he said, Martha, would you just go on and push open the door? Yes, Papa, I will push open the door. There's some medical metaphorical door somewhere he needed pushed. Um, another time he was bunching up all of the uh, bed clothes in the hospital bed. And he's just pulling them and he's grimace on, grimace on his face. And I said, Papa, what are you doing? And he said, there's a, there's a latch here. There's a latch I said, okay, I don't see it. And he said, well, look, would you unlatch it for me? So I got in there and I messed around with the bedclothes. And I said, there, Papa, I unlatched it. And he just immediately relaxed. And he said, oh, that feels better. So in, if, if he had he been on hospice, these all would have been signs that he is moving closer and closer to death. These are these are part of the deathbed phenomenon. These are metaphors, and and this is the this is when I talk about tracking the frequency. This is what I'm tracking. I'm mm -hmm. tracking these uh, metaphors that he's using, the language that he's using. Uh, he wants to get up and out of bed. He wants to walk through that door. Um, yeah, he's not he's not so interested in eating. There's a point where um, people who are dying don't they don't want clothes on. They don't want bed clothes on, no sheets, no nothing. And uh, I, I talk about that, that it's, it's like the spirit is trying to loose itself from the body. And I'll now say again, this is very clear to me now, in the hospital, uh, I still think he was trying to die. I really think he was. But in the hospital, he gets treated so he can come back. Had he been on hospice, that would have continued on. And there would have been a point where all of that settled, and that is the case when, when uh, my mother had, they call it terminal restlessness. I think it's a terrible name, but it's that getting all that stuff off and then you get calm. And then, you know, as I was talking earlier, she talked, she talked about seeing her family member, but it was through closed eyelids. And that's, that's often the case after, after terminal restlessness that there's, um, there's things they see in their mind's eye. And that, that reaching is another, another frequency to track. So, you'll see people reach up and move things around. Um, and sometimes it's work. Dad was trying to move some cows to him. And I have no idea where in his life he had cows around. I'm, I need to ask him when he gets more uh, alert. But he had to move those around and he was moving some robes around and doing different things. 
there's another kind of reaching at the very end when they're when they're almost ready to go where they reach up and that's what my mother was doing that last I don't know five ten hours that she was alive and it is straight up high uh, and and sometimes they'll do both hands um, people used to fall out of bed they'd find them on the floor dead and um, they were reaching they're trying to get up to that thing whatever it was that was up there my my aunt Betty had those she had a stroke and she couldn't talk and you know one side of her body wasn't working very well and the other side she was able to reach up and um, my cousin said she was really seemed very frustrated she just dropped her hand one day and she said I guess they left and they left without her we laughed about that so, Mar- so that's what I mean by tracking frequency okay Martha um when you when I saw you give this talk about this, you had video clips. Is there any way that you can give me a link that I can post on the interview page? Sure, sure I can. Okay, so be glad to. those were really profound. So for those of you that are listening and trying to understand that, that was really kind of what hooked me in, were those video clips of seeing people do this with Martha's description. So, uh, Yeah, that, and that, that video just got, uh, I just got the ring ring back from it. So I'll, I'll get that up and you bet. That'll be a good thing. That'll be good. And so... Now, one of the things is, um, like I was talking to a friend who's a physician and who had just gone through the loss of a family member, and um, she was very adamant that what you're talking about, this deathbed phenomenon, was hallucinations, right? And so, and is, isn't there like a sector that it's like, no, this isn't really real. This is, these are just hallucinations. Exactly. There are, there are lots of people who say that this is purely, um, this is uh, the brain not getting enough oxygen. There are some people that say these are memories from a lifetime that come flooding back, that there's a special hormone that's released that makes all this happen. Um, they can't prove that definitively, nor can I say that these are deathbed, these deathbed visions are definitively, definitively their people coming back to talk to them or help them cross over. Even so, um, we get to pick and I, um, this is one of the things I learned from Martha Beck. She talked about uh, believing in those things that feel good. And I want to, I want to believe that my family members are met by somebody. And by golly, if my mother says that her favorite uh, grandparents came and her parents came and her favorite aunt and uncle came, uh, I, I don't know for sure that that's what happened, but it sure does make me feel better to think that. And it sure does make me, Um, it makes me smile and gives me comfort when I think about her sharing that moment with me right before she died. And so from that standpoint, um, I I don't really, I I wouldn't say I don't really care what other people believe, but I don't, um, I I, I want to allow them to believe whatever they want to believe. And I'm going to believe what I do. Well, and, you know, a couple things that come to mind for me, Martha, is one is, is there really any harm done? Right? Yeah. And that's one. And then two is there's so, like, even when we go into the science, right, there's so little that we really know that, and, and I love how you use the word wonder because maybe mm-hmm. it is possible and mm-hmm. and we don't know. And so w- why why not even just open up that window of possibility for us? And especially if it makes us feel better as we go through this process. Yeah, and and I th- I think for me the other piece of this is it, there are um, a myriad of things that happen as someone is dying, and they happen to, to like I said before, all over the world, all ages, all races, all colors. Doesn't matter if you're on an island in Samoa or in San Antonio down the road from me. There there are similarities that happen. And that, that guy in, in Samoa is going to be raising his arm just like my dad did last week. And um, people get to, this goes back to that meaning-making thing, you get to make whatever meaning out of that you want to. Mm-hmm. And I choose to say uh, family members come to visit, angels come to visit. I don't know what what that reality is. I just know what my person said to me. And I know that it was comforting to them. Um, my dad was was uh, he was he was perplexed by the angel. He was excited, but he was perplexed. He couldn't understand why it was there, and and then he got a big grin on his face. 
And I'll tell you, watching him be that wrestling in that in that uh, terminal restlessness place, and then going and seeing something that brought him comfort brought me comfort. So I, I don't know if it's real real or not, but I know that it was real to him. So that's what I'm going with. Mm-hmm. And I have a question. I don't know if you'd want to answer this or not, but uh, you've brought this up. And if you don't want to answer, it's fine. But this this idea of going to the hospital versus doing hospice. Yeah. What was the what was the deciding factor for your father if you if you don't mind to share? Yeah, no, I don't mind at all. So so this is the thing about families. Uh we have different personalities, we have different knowledge, um, we want different things. We we um uh my dad has a DNR status, which means if he if anything happens to him, we are not going to resuscitate him. And he has this um uh, he has a, a chronic condition of which he will not be cured. So he's treatable, but not curable. And, uh, he, he will, if, if he does indeed get better from this, he'll leave the hospital and he'll go home and then he's going to be in the hospital again. So the conversation in our family was how sick is he? And from, from my standpoint, I was watching him and I was watching the, the visions and watching the trajectory, uh, tracking the frequency and I was seeing somebody who was ready to go. My brother was not seeing the same thing. And so we had to, and the doctor, nor, nor was the doctor. The doctor said, you know, we can, we can place a line. We can put a central line and all of dad's veins had blown. We can put in a line and we can give him antibiotics and I believe we can get him well. And, uh, that's, that's what my brother wanted to do. And I Gosh, it's I say this out loud. I don't want my dad to die. I don't want him to go. I don't want him to suffer. And I had to get to the point last last several days where I realized it it's not so much him that I didn't want to suffer. It's me that I didn't want to suffer because it's going to hurt. Um, uh, either way, it's going to hurt. Watching him be sick again is going to hurt. Um, watching him die is going to hurt. But ultimately, this is this is our dad and. Uh, if there was an opportunity for him to be well, we needed to to do that. So that's what we did. And he, dad is still in the hospital and dad is coherent now and he wants medicine. So we want what he wants. So that's, that's why we are where we are. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> that's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a struggle that families have and, uh, I, I got an email from a, a woman whose brother was a doctor, and she said, you know, when our dad was dying, he's the one that I thought would say, no more, no more. And she said he's the one that was putting on the full court press. And she's this woman's a nurse, and she said, I could see how things were moving, um, but he couldn't. And I, I don't know that I was right. I don't know that my, that my brother is right, but I'm just saying that th- this is the kind of thing that happens in families. The hospital's want to keep the patient alive and will do things um, as long as they can to do that. And uh, I, I live in a world where, um, where I talk with patients as much as possible and say, what do you want? What do you want? And if, if you're sure you don't want to keep doing this, you need to lead your family. You need to tell them what you want and be very clear about it. And those are hard conversations to have. And my goodness, we've had a lot of them in ours. My dad's got a funeral planned. Um, it's a it's a it's a fascinating adventure, and and we are on it. We're still living it, and um, yeah, it's probably more than you wanted to know. But there no, you go. No, I th- I think well, I think that's great for the listeners because you know here you have all this experience, right? But it's not black and white, and then the, it's the, not. You know, and it's the realities not. of having different people with different viewpoints in, in a hospital and doctors with the idea that they're in the business of saving people. Absolutely are. That's their job. So, you know, and for you to be able to look at the whole picture instead of saying, no, this is the way, this is the only way, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which probably adds more to the grief, doesn't it? Yeah. When people get into yeah, that, I think so. that fixed yeah. mindset. Well, and I, I said to my brother last week, if it was just me, if I was the only sibling knowing where dad was last week, I would have taken him home on hospice. And had he been the only sibling knowing what he knew, he would not. Things would be exactly exactly the way they are. 
but but we're not. We're in this together, and uh, and that that is that is a reality with so many families. There there are lots of people who are in that decision making, and um, it's a it's not black and white. It's just not. And it doesn't matter how much training you have or what your what your work in the world is when it when it comes down to it. And it's your your parent, your child, your spouse. Um, you you think long and hard about it, mm-hmm. and you make decisions that you maybe you think you wouldn't have, but you do. And it's okay. We do the best we can in the moment. And I think that is a great point. So thank you for sharing that because sometimes we can beat ourselves up and say, "Well, you know, I know better, so I should do better." But it's, exactly. it's not that simple of an answer. Nope. Nope. It's really not. And that's, that's a really good reason to have wise counsel around you and have people around you you can talk to that know you well and know your family situation well and um, will, will not be the advice givers, but will help you tease through the question so you can find your own answers. And that's so important. Somebody comes in telling you what to do, and I would take about fifteen steps back. <laughs> it's those it's those people who ask you questions that help you get clear. Those are the ones that you want to pay attention to. Very good point. Very mm-hmm. good point. So as we wrap up, um, what are a couple of takeaways? And we can even use that wise counsel around you as a takeaway, but for people as they go through death and dying. Yeah, I think I think that wise counsel is one. There we we talk so much about um I was telling somebody yesterday, we talk about the village. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to do everything, people. <laughs> it really does. And when somebody's dying, uh, it's okay to to ask a lot of questions and not be embarrassed about the questions, just ask because most people haven't been in that in that situation before. Seek people out, um, and as I said, uh, it, people are real interested in giving advice and how it happened when their person died, and all that's well and good, but it's not your particular situation. So find people who will who will ask you questions and help you that will help you um, be able to find your own answers and get clear. Um, w- with that, Martha, like when people talk sure. about their stories, like you've talked about your stories. Could people then take that, not that it has to be a blueprint, right? Because I'm against blueprints, but it it can, at least if they're opening up and hearing your story, right? Especially with you with all your knowledge and experience, and this is your profession, and then how you actually implemented it with your father this past week, but to give like insight and nuggets of inspiration about, okay, now what can I go do in my family circumstances? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so not only yeah. asking the questions, but gathering stories, but for nuggets, not for a blueprint. Right. I, I would completely agree with that. Okay. And, and and I will in I would invite people to instead of just saying, Oh my gosh, let me tell you the story and how we did it with our family, ask the person, Can I share with you a piece of our experience and maybe this will help you? Because mm. I I hear um I hear stories from, from people and situations from people and I think, okay, I can bounce off that and there are pieces of it that I absolutely can use and I love that. And I hope that happens today, that people will hear some things that I talked about and they can bounce off of it and use it in their own situation. But uh, I'm completely with you. There's there's no br- blueprint because my my situation, our situation is is different than, than anybody else who, who will be listening. That's really, that's good. Um, the other, I, I guess... <laughs> I, I would invite people to be gentle with themselves. And what I said a while ago was, you know, we do the best we can. We do the best we can with the knowledge we have in the moment. And um, I, we do have a tendency to beat ourselves up that we didn't do we didn't do this thing right. And what I what I know about people who are dying is that they have a whole lot more control than we give them credit for. If my dad was ready to go, he would have been gone. And there, there's not anything in the world that, that my brother or I could have done about it. Uh, I hear often people say, I, I didn't get there in time or I just left for a few minutes and he died. Um, people wait. People wait for people to come. Dying people wait for people to come. Dying people wait for people to go. And they they have that control, even though we don't think they do. So, um so yeah, I just I I hope people will ease up on themselves a little bit and and 
do their best to stay in the moment. And, um, and the way I do, I do have to stop sometimes and feel my feet in my shoes and feel my butt on the chair and take a breath in and pay attention to what I hear and get myself in the moment because it's easy to be 59 steps ahead, what's going to happen next. And then we miss those precious times right here, right now. Martha, so maybe that was two things. No, that, yes, was, ma'am. that was very good. Thank you so much good. for starting this conversation for my listeners. So thank you. My pleasure. I thank you so much for asking me. It's been, it's been a delight. Thank you. Wow. Well, that's the first time I had a conversation about death and dying on the show. And I really invite you to, to go ahead and go to the interview page with Martha Atkins and take a look at the video clip of the, um, of the clips that she has, because those were really powerful for me. You know, one of the things is that I love how she talks about these, uh, deathbed phenomenons or versus hallucinations in checking in with how is it that you feel, right? We can be skeptical. I'm highly skeptical. If you've been hanging out in this radio show for a while, you know that I ask the questions. I'm always kind of wondering where's the proof? Where's the evidence, right? But at the same time, I'm really open about it. Like there's so much stuff that I don't know about. And so without really knowing all the answers, what if it could be possible? What if there is really a deathbed phenomenon? Maybe there are hallucinations. But when you go through this experience, what is going to create more peace with you as you're going through the grief of losing a loved one? So that's something that I thought really resonated with me. And I'll think about, um, hopefully I won't have to experience this for quite some time. And, uh, but I will think about this and remember this because how do you, you want to feel and what are the things that you can help do that? And I love how she talks about how, you know, death is both mysterious and wondrous, right? And I think I just made up a word, but, you know, we can, if we can open up into our minds and that goes into Carol Dweck, who's been a previous guest on the show where she's talked about the growth mindset. There's so much that we don't know. And what if it could be possible? Something else that Martha talked about was it takes a village to go through this process of death and dying. And really, it takes a village to do everything. And I think about that a lot. I think about in my own life, who are the people that are on my team, right? And there's I have different teammates for different segments of my life, right? And so, you know, when I was an athlete in college, I was a swimmer, and then I went off and played water polo in the off season. So I had different teammates. I had the, my swim team teammates and then I had my water polo teammates. And then if I did intramural club sport or intramural sports, like inner tube water polo, there was another set of teammates, right? And then I had another group when I was doing this peer counseling program for athletes. And those were athletes that were outside of the aquatic sports, right? And they were teammates. So who's on your team and identifying the different teams that you have? right? Instead of thinking that, I think we get in this mistaken belief of, I must do it myself. And I know I can get into that belief, but I also know that I really thrive under connection. So what about you? I love how Martha talked about, you know, asking lots of questions, seeking people out as you go through this death and dying experience. And then her takeaways, weren't they great? Like this idea of, um, when you, uh, if you know somebody that's going through it, it's not about you need to fix this situation for your friend or your loved one who is going through, you know, a loss um, of somebody that they care about. But, you know, to maybe be a container, to be wise counsel, to be able to ask questions, to help them get clarity, right? And then also offering to share your story, but asking, what did she say? She said, can I share my story with you? It's a piece of our experience that maybe you can bounce some ideas off of, right? And, and, and being receptive that they say, no, it's not about your story not being good enough. They just not may, may not be in the time or the place to be able to, um, receive it. And that's okay. So I invite you to start a conversation, right? Start talking about it with your loved ones, with somebody that's safe. And maybe it's a good friend. Maybe it's a friend on the other side of the country. But who can you talk to about this? About what, how is it that you want to go through this process if you are the one that's dying? How is it that you want to go through this process of if somebody you care about is dying? Right. And start the discussion because I think as we talk about it more, 
the fear will subside, right? Because right now I'm not engaged in this process, but I'm really, now that we've started this conversation with Martha and she's going to come back again, but now that I've started this conversation with her, I'm going to open up my mindset about this, really think about it. You know, hopefully I'm in the middle of my life and hopefully, you know, those that I really love and care about will be good to go for a really long time. But I also know that I'm a slow learner and I need a lot of practice. So with that, you know, me to have a conversation and to be talking with my husband many years ago when we had our kids, I made sure that everything was all taken care of because my, my father had died when I was pregnant with my, my firstborn child. And, um, so I got really anal, made sure everything was taken care of. And we did our, uh, um, health directives and stuff. And we had that conversation, but you know, that was about 14 or 15 years ago. And it's time to revisit that and take a look. Are we, do we have different beliefs than we did maybe 14 or 15 years ago? What can we tweak? What needs to stay the same? So these are just really important things to, and I think one of, for me, the most important skill that I use is reflecting. Because when I can reflect, I stay out of that place of judgment. Because when I go into that place of judgment, I beat myself up. And that was one of the things that Martha had, you know, recommended as a takeaway was to be gentle with ourselves, right? We're going to do the best that we can with the knowledge that we have in the moment. And that is so true. And then as we learn more, because life is learning, that's what it's really about. At least I believe so. Then you can tweak it, revisit it, shift you know, throw out what's no longer applicable, add in. Things are changing. Things are dynamic. And it's about having that agility. So thank you for hanging in there on this, you know, tough topic from so many of us, right? And I look forward to hearing from you about how this show impacted you. Thanks for listening to How She Really Does It. I invite you to subscribe to my weekly newsletter at How She Really Does It. Dot com. I do this show each week for you so you can now see the windows of possibilities in your own life. I believe there are many journeys for us to take. We can learn from others to see what is possible for ourselves. I believe there are possibilities for all of us, not just the ones who've acquired great success, but including those of us who have stumbled lost our way, or only saw closed doors. With this show, maybe you can now see a glimmer coming through the windows. I call that the windows of possibility. Each week, I bring a guest who represents those possibilities. They too have had their own struggles and uncertainty, yet somehow they have found their way. My guests are an example of what is possible when you continue when you learn, leap, fall down, and get back up. I invite you into this space so you can ask yourself, if that is possible for them, what is possible for me? Really ask yourself that. I would love to connect with you. Please join me at www.howshereallydoesit.com. And thanks for listening today. On a lake, she is dreaming, she is drifting, never been so wild.